Thank you for being with us this morning, all of you. Okay. Uh, today, my message today begins the, a series of messages that I'm going to be basing on the classic unity series called Foundations of Unity. And this is uh, series number two. Now, some of you may remember they used to have the old correspondence course, okay? I think it was a blue, uh, blue booklet that you would get in the mail and you would uh, fill that out and send that in, okay? Uh, the second edition, that is a tan color. And I meant to bring the book with me, the, the volume set. It's a three volume set. And basically, this series two is based on Harriet Emily Cady's book, Lessons in Truth, okay? Um, Cady uh, wrote that book in 1860, 1896, excuse me. And it kind of became Unity's basic text book. Uh, the Fillmore's realized that Katie had a way of expressing the truth principles in a way that was very clear and easier to understand. And if you get one of her books, Lessons in Truth, now you're going to think it's pretty K, uh, what's the word? It's archaic. For example, at the beginning of the book, Emily Cady's first chapter, she says, the reason we suffer is because we believe that we are in bondage to the things of the flesh, to the flesh and the things of the flesh. Now, you know, when you first read that, you think, now, what is she talking about, okay? It sounds like Cady is saying we're some kind of sex fiends or something, okay? We're in bondage to the flesh and the things of the flesh. That is not what Katie means at all. What she is basically saying, and this begins the premise of the Foundations of Unity booklets here, is that uh, in our human expression, we often falsely and in error believe that we are in bondage, held captive. We are prisoners by our experiences and the circumstances of our lives. We often think that other people can control us and have power over us. We think that there is limited resources in the world and we've got to scrape or we've got to find a way to take from others in order to have our good. These are all error beliefs that we as humans uh, sometimes let control us. And that's what Katie is meaning when she says that the human condition or the reason that we suffer is because we believe that we are in bondage to these things out there in the world. And the series of books in Foundations of Unity begin with that premise. And as we move through the lessons in volume one, volume two, and volume three, we realize that it's taking us on a journey, okay? a journey of awareness. We begin with this, uh, and we, from this we move into an awareness of how we have allowed our ego self to pretty much control things and run our show. And we learned how to take that power back by realizing who we are, what our true identity is, and what our true connection with God is. So today, I would like to explore with you what makes us unforgettable. And yes, I did title this talk after a song by Irving Gordon, which he wrote in 1951, uh, but it was made famous by Nat King Cole when he sang it in 1952. It was arranged slightly differently. Unforgettable. I wasn't going to sing that. <laughs> I even left the words at home. <laughs> That's just what you are. Uh, something about near or far. And it's marvelous. I think it's absolutely incredible that someone who is so unforgettable thinks that I am unforgettable too. Well, I think that you and I and all of us are unforgettable. And the reason that we are unforgettable is because of this incredible presence and power that God is in us, moving through us, working in us and through us. And we were born with this. It's our inheritance, our birthright, the Christ indwells us. And this makes us unforgettable. Now, we often hear 
the statement that we live, we move, and we have our being in God. Well, what is so amazing here, when Jesus asked, was asked by the Pharisees, how can we tell when the kingdom is coming? Tell us when the kingdom of God is coming. And he said, it's not, going to, it's not a situation where it's, it's something you can observe. You won't be able to say, here it is, or lo, there it is, okay? Because the kingdom of God is within you, Luke 17, 21. Now, what's so marvelous about this is the realization that the kingdom is God's home. It is where God lives. And God's home is in you and in me. Again, we often hear we live and move and have our being in God, but what Jesus is saying is that God lives and moves and has its being in us. That makes us unforgettable. And the key to our unforgettable spiritual identity is understanding who we are. I, who am I? I am a spiritual being where God lives and moves and has its being. And who are you? You are a spiritual being where God lives and moves and has its being. Knowing that we have within us this awesome presence and power. In fact, in unity, we understand that this presence and power we call God is the only presence and power there is in the universe. So knowing that we have this within us and that this presence of love, divine love, there are many names that we call it, the Christ, the higher self, the Holy Spirit. That's something in us that Jesus recognized was divine in himself and that presence of divinity in each one of us. That's what he meant. The kingdom of God is within. So knowing that we have this, and that all joy, Emily Katie says, in Lessons of Truth and Foundations of Unity, all joy comes from this source. All prosperity, all good, all wholeness comes from this one source. And it isn't out there. We may think, she says, that we are, that we are supported and held up and, and prospered by other people. But the source is God. Yes, God does move through other people and experiences in our life to provide what we need to live joyously and happily. But the source, the ultimate source, is God. And God is home in us. So how is it that we can be unhappy? How is it that we can be fearful? How is it that we can be jealous of what someone else has when we have the source of all good within us? It's a curious kind of thing. Well. What happens, actually, is we forget, Foundations of Unity says, we forget who we are. We forget our spiritual identity. And we begin to think that we are our thoughts. We are our feelings. We say, I am sad. I'm depressed. Uh, I'm sick. And we identify our I am self. I am, okay, is another name for this presence in us. I am. It comes from the Old Testament when Moses asked uh, the Lord, who should I tell the Egyptians is having me come to say, let my people go. And uh, the Old Testament uh, tells us that the word of the Lord said, I am. Tell them I am sent you. I am that I am. And so another name for God is I am, capital letters. And so we begin, uh, I guess, in an early age to identify with things around us, with objects. In fact, I believe, now I've never had children, so some of you probably know this better than I, but very young children, infants, begin by identifying, or should I say, not uh, recognizing a distinction between themselves and, say, the mother. And as the child grows, then they begin to realize, you know, this is something else. This is not me. This is a table. This is a desk. This is a candle, okay? And those things are not me. And so a whole belief in separation, that there are things that are me and things that are not me. They are other than me, okay? And we move into adulthood here, and we still carry this belief that somehow we're separated 
from things, from life, from, from our good. And the ego comes to play. We create the ego. It's an interface that we use. Um, although at an early spiritual stage, the ego can dominate and control us. But once we begin to grow spiritually, we realize I am not my thoughts. I am the thinker of those thoughts. I am not my feelings. I am that which feels those feelings. And we realize that we are something more. We are something deeper. But in the meantime, we can feel the sense of separation. And we can feel sadness and unhappy and angry. In fact, you know, we go back and forth. We are spiritual beings which are perfect, perfect in expression of that God presence in us. But it is also true that we are spiritual beings, but we are expressing through this thing called, or experience called humanness. And this experience called humanness has a purpose, a divine purpose. It provides us with lessons, with corrections even. But it's good. It's all good, okay? Uh, as long as we realize that we are something more. Our problem seems to be that we, we, we forget and we identify with the things out there instead of the things in here. Yes, God is present out there in the world, but God is also present within each of us. And the problem is that we don't recognize our true face. There's a story about a woman, uh, a wife, okay? And one morning, she woke up and uh, she grabbed her phone and started tapping on the, uh, the interface, okay? And it wasn't working. And then she jumped out of bed. She, she said some curse word and she jumped out of bed and ran in the bathroom. Her husband woke up and wonder what's going on, okay? She's upset about something, so he runs into the bathroom to find out what's wrong. And when he opens the door, she is furiously putting on her makeup. And he says, honey, what, what are you doing, okay? Uh, you just got up and you don't even work today. So what, what are you doing? She said, I locked my phone with face recognition and apparently it doesn't know me without my makeup. But there is a sense that we have the same problem with ourselves that this woman had with her phone. We do not recognize our true face. We look in the mirror and we don't know who we are, okay? We say yes when we really mean no. We take on different, uh, different assignments, jobs, whatever. We say yes to these things when our heart is not in it. We're not living with integrity in terms of who we truly are. And, uh, and we don't let people know what our needs are, okay? We act like we don't need anyone, okay? It's me against the world, okay? And that whole belief in separation again. We are together because God wants us together. We're two or more are gathered together. There I am in the midst of you. So community is an important thing. And we cannot escape community because that's, that is one of the one of the areas that provides us with support, with learning opportunities, and as I said, corrections as well. So this is a good thing. The problem is, again, we don't recognize ourself. Richard Rohr, a Franciscan monk, wrote, our true self is who we objectively are from the moment our creation in the mind of God. The face we had before we were born. War continues, it is who we were before we did anything right or wrong. Before we made any decisions for good or for ill. The true self in us is our substantial self, our absolute self, which can't be gained or lost by any technique, any group affiliation, morality, or any formula whatsoever. 
How do we regain a sense of awe about the presence and power of God that is working in us and through us, which makes us unforgettable? On page 28 of Foundations of Unity, we are given an answer that the primary need, the primary step, excuse me, that we need to do to take freedom from, to move toward freedom from adversity and any kind of suffering lies in attaining a consciousness of our oneness with God. Does that make sense? In practicing the presence of God at all times, in all conditions, wherever we are, we begin to find that we can let go of these troubling situations that are based in our outer experiences. That doesn't mean we can sit back and do nothing, but it means we don't have to experience the angst while we are working through a situation. We can be open to divine guidance so that we know how to go about things. I want to share with you an experience that I had on Easter Sunday. So I, I call this kind of resurrection experience. Okay? Those of you who were here, you know that the weather began to get kind of bad. It started raining, kind of middle of the service, okay? Uh, and then at some point, someone came back in and said, there's ice out there, okay? There's sleet falling, okay? And uh, she's not here, but Suzanne, I understand, scraped my car windows and stuff for me. Uh, and so we all kind of hustled around to get our stuff to get out and everyone get home safely. And I know that, that, uh, uh, that everybody here was praying for our safety, the safety of everyone traveling in that kind of weather, okay? And um, I got out here and uh, I got on Highway 18. And uh, Franklin, Franklin is my car, for those who don't know, or I should say was my car. Okay. Uh, in, in, anyway, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's, uh, he got hauled off, okay. Uh, but, but anyway, Franklin and I, uh, we were on Highway 18. And as we're going down the road, everyone is going slow. And I'm going slowly because, you know, there's sleet falling on my windshield and stuff. So I'm not being crazy with it, okay. Uh, and I see further down, I see the lights of the highway patrol flashing. All kinds of color on the highway. You know, it's pretty, but it means trouble, okay. Um, and uh, as I get closer, I see that there has been a collision of two cars. And in fact, they are overhanging the highway. And the only way to get by is the right shoulder, the right-hand shoulder. So I move to the right shoulder, and I'm just creeping along, getting closer. I don't know what, no one, the highway patrol is not stopping anyone, okay? Uh, but as I got closer, I really didn't want to slide into those two cars that were already there. This accident had happened earlier because the people uh, had already been vacated. But the wreck was still there uh, in, right in the middle of traffic. Anyway, as I started to slow uh, Franklin even more, we went into a spin. I have never had a car go in a spin. I've skidded a little bit, okay? Uh, and I barely miss some parked cars, okay? Uh, but we went into a spin, okay? And this was unreal, okay? I'm going, I go into a spin. I know those two cars are in the road there, and I do not want to slam into those two, okay? Uh, and Franklin does a 180 degree turn. I'm, I'm, I'm steering because I remember, steer in the direction of us, and then I realized that's a slide, that's not a spin, okay? <laughs> and I've steered, and the brakes don't work, pumping doesn't work, and I let go. I decide, I let go. Hands off the wheel, no pumping the brake, and I just let Franklin go wherever Franklin was gonna go. So we ended up 180 degree in the left hand shoulder of the highway. Now I'm facing oncoming traffic. Okay. And something strange happened with Franklin. We made this spin, okay? Then it's like somebody grabbed Franklin, okay? And took it and pushed us back to the right so that the right passenger side above that uh, tire there hit the guardrail. This stopped us. It stopped us from, uh, from, uh, uh, from spinning. And I thought, this was just really weird, how it just stopped and it moves back, hits the guardrail, and we are stopped. And I'm thinking, I'm good. <laughs> nothing hurt, nothing whatever. I'm good. It wasn't even frightening to me. It was an amazing experience, okay, after letting go. Um, 
and realizing that there is something greater than me working in and through me. Anyway, I thought, hmm, this is probably not a good idea to be facing oncoming traffic. So I decided to see whether or not the car was movable. I had no idea how much damage because the bump didn't seem that hard, okay? Uh, and so I started up and Franklin is rolling. I don't hear any strange noises. So I turned him around, go back 180 degrees, and I put myself in the right shoulder now because that's the only way to get by the cars that are, uh, had crashed in the highway there. And I sat there and I thought, this probably is not good because what if some of those others come down and I'm a sitting duck right here? But I wasn't worried about it or fearful, you know, because what do you do? What do you do when there's, some, when there's nothing you can do? Unfortunately, sometimes we have to be put in that place to realize that we can let go. And we can let God. Anyway, while I'm sitting there, a car comes down, misses me, and bam, right into the other two cars that are already in the highway. I thought, oh my goodness, okay. Well, he went by me. Bam. Uh, while I'm out there, okay, now the good thing, didn't seem as though anyone needed any physical help. No ambulances were called or anything like that, so no one was hurt. We're all going slow, so, you know, that I'm sure helped. Anyway, uh, finally, the uh, highway patrol guy comes down and he walks along the right lane. By now, other cars have stopped and back of me, okay. And he comes down and says, uh, uh, are you hurt? I said, no. He said, well, if you can, did you collide with any person? I said, no, we hit the guardrail. He said, if you can, go forward. Ease up, go forward, see if you can get out of this area. Uh, it, uh, the ice is going on forever, okay. See if you can get out of it. So I start Franklin up and... He's moving, he's moving, no strange noises. This is good, I'm creeping on. I creep by those three cars now that are crashed out in the highway. I ease on by them and I decided, huh, we may as well creep on home. <laughs> so Franklin and I went home, okay? And uh, I was too tired to whatever. I just opened the garage door and put him in there. I didn't even take a look to see what the damage was on the car. But the next morning I saw it, okay? Uh, and that's kind of a whole other story, okay. <laughs> I thought Franklin was fixable, okay, but the insurance uh, uh, company decided that he was too old, okay, and it was time to put him out to pasture. He's 12 years old and had over 185,000 miles. They said, no, okay, <laughs> no. Uh, b reason being, of course, because uh, as the mechanic told me, they really couldn't tell how much damage was done to the frame and that kind of thing underneath there. And it might be that the cost uh, of, and they quoted $2,700 to get it fixed, that that might be way higher. And he said, if it was me, i walk away. Well, he doesn't know me and Franklin. <laughs> okay. But I decided in the wisdom of this, divine guidance is speaking, because I truly didn't know. And I appreciated his honesty. You know, he could have said, yeah, we'll fix it, whatever, and, and, and kind of soaked it here. But uh, the insurance said, no. We call it a non-repairable, whatever, claim or something or other. Okay. So um, they came and picked up Franklin yesterday. So uh, I borrowed a friend's car. That's what brought me here today. But I do hope to be riding in something next week. Okay. So the next time I see you, probably, I'll have Clarence or George or <laughs> Martin, whoever. <laughs> but the story in this is the feeling of letting go. Truly. Again, we often have to be put in those situations before we realize we can let go of control. I stopped trying to control Franklin. I stopped trying to control the situation. I stopped trying to control me. And I was at peace. Even though all this was going on, even though the bam of that other car, whatever, okay, and it could have hit me, I was okay. Okay? And this is where we want to be. This is where we want to get. This makes us unforgettable. When we can rest in this awareness that there is a presence and power working in us for good. I wasn't hurt. Okay. And Franklin, that good boy, he was old, that's true. Okay. 
And I was thinking of replacing him in a couple of years, okay? So I had life kind of quickened up. Sometimes it's like that too. We're expecting we have more time for something and life moves us along more quickly than we expect. We have to kind of ride that current also and stop resisting and start trusting. Trusting makes us unforgettable. I had another story to share, but I think I've gone kind of long with that. So I'll save this other story for the, another time. But the main, my main learning experience is this just totally letting go and being at peace, even though negative stuff, bad stuff that's going on around me. Okay? We can choose this. We do have choice because we are not our thoughts. We are not our feelings. We have those feelings. We have those thoughts, and we can change them. Um, I have heard some friends say, oh my gosh, I would have been terrified, okay? You're so calm about it, okay? Well, what else can you do, okay? My choice was to get crazy with it. Would that help? No. But yet I have this understanding that there is something beyond this appearance here, working for good. Uh, Paul said, how's that go? All things work together for good to those that love the Lord, okay? To those that, that love that presence and honor that presence of God in them. Things work out because we are trusting it. God bless you. You are unforgettable.